Hello everyone, and welcome to another exciting episode of Bulbacast. I'm your host, the magnificently extraordinary Maniacal Engineer. Do you remember back in Episode 2 when Rocket Queen and Glick joked about it not being the Mario Odyssey episode? Well, guess what? This is the Mario Odyssey episode. Sort of. Today, we're taking a look back at the year 2017 and some of the major titles and systems released in the gaming world during that year. Now, as someone who pretty much only played Pokemon Sun, Civilization VI, Civilization III, and Pokemon Ultra Moon during 2017, I'm hardly qualified to give any opinions on this subject. But, luckily, I'm joined by three of my fellow Bulba Garden staffers who have played many of the big titles from last year. Joining us first and foremost is Rocket Queen, who has returned after being blasted off in Episode 2. I'm blasting off again! So, I played pretty much everything that was notable except for Persona. I have an unopened copy of that sitting on my desk. Um, but besides that, I can give opinions on everything important, which includes Fire Emblem, Fire Emblem, and also Fire Emblem. No surprises there. Next up is Glick, who has been in every episode so far, a distinction shared only by myself. And that's where the similarities end, I hope. <laughs> Luckily for you. <laughs> I've played the two real big Nintendo releases of last year, as well as a few bigger ones from other companies throughout the year. Also, some smaller releases released through usually digital means. And last but certainly not least, Sephir is making yet another appearance. Bonjour! So I've played a few big games of 2017 and a few less big games, so we'll see. Alright, so I guess question number one you've all sort of answered, but let's, uh, let's get you to be a little bit more specific. What games did you guys play that were released either in late 2016 or during 2017, other than Pokemon Ultra Moon, because we already know about that. RQ, let's start with you. Sure. Um, so I played, as uh, Glick said, I played the two big Nintendo releases, uh, Odyssey and Breath of the Wild, which I'm sure are going to be focuses of the conversation. I also played Fire Emblem Echoes. I know, shocking. Um, beyond that, I um, I really spent a lot of time playing uh, PUBG, aka Player Unknown Battlegrounds. That was probably my most played game of the year. I think I put in a few hundred hours of that with uh, some of my college buddies. Uh, Horizon Zero Dawn was a was a real favorite of mine this year. Um, I mean, just the expansive open world of that game was phenomenal. The art direction, in particular, was incredible. I mean, it's kind of a shame that that game was so sort of put to the side when Breath of the Wild came out. Um, beyond that, uh, Nier. Nier was another game I was uh, I really enjoyed. Um, and I think that's the big one. So I could go into little games for a long time. Uh, ports. I played Bayonetta again when it came out on the PC. Um, but I think I'll leave it there to kind of open up discussion. All right, Glick, what about you? Like I said, I also played Odyssey, Breath of the Wild. Uh, also played Nier Automata and Wolfenstein 2, The New Colossus. Smaller games like uh, Sonic Mania, Pyre, and uh, For Honor. How sad is it that Sonic is a small game now? <laughs> well, it's actually better as a small game, so I'm kind of happy. That's true. That, that's a fair point. <laughs> I remember playing the original Sonic trilogy on the Genesis. <laughs> <laughs> Fun times. All right, Saf, how about you? So big games, I played uh, Super Mario Odyssey, The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, of course, Horizon Zero Dawn, a little Splatoon 2, Mario Kart 8 Deluxe, which counts since the Deluxe version was in 2017, and uh, Mass Effect Andromeda. Ooh. I tried to forget that. <laughs> <laughs> I liked it. And smaller games, I played uh, Ark, Survival Evolved, Pokémon Tournament, Avon Colony, and Ever Was This. What was that last one? Ever Was This, which was released on 3DS. It's a very small game, but uh, I had fun playing it. Sorry, are you saying Ever Oasis? Yeah. Okay. Sorry for my French. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so it, it does seem that between the three of you, we've gotten, you know, the, the major titles covered and a lot of the smaller stuff, which is important. So I guess the, the next question is, you know, what were some of your favorite moments from these games that were released and that you played this past year? And, uh, you know, what were, among all the titles that you played, what were your favorites and, and potentially some of the ones that you weren't expecting to be as good, but, you know, you, you ended up enjoying a lot more than you thought you would? Let's start with Glick this time. High points for the year. 
was about the entire campaign of Wolfenstein 2. That's a really crazy game if you're into high action. Uh, Odyssey is probably my favorite game of the year because it's so good in every way. Uh, Breath of the Wild, I've never actually been a big Legend of Zelda fan. I Just the puzzles don't really do it for me. But with the whole exploration, I really sunk a lot of time into that. A lot more than I ever thought I would. And probably the number one of it that sticks in my mind the most is the ending of Nier Automata. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> that was a thing. Yeah. Like, Odyssey, I would say is my overall favorite, but my favorite singular moment is the ending of Nier. All right, fair enough. I suppose I don't get it since I didn't play it, but it seems like that was definitely a uh, an interesting twist or an interesting ending. Um, RQ, what about you? So my favorite game of the year was probably Odyssey as well. Um, in particular, it also had my high point moment of the year was that scene um, in Odyssey where you're at the festival and uh, that mix of jump up superstars playing and you're running through that whole 8-bit scene in uh, in New Donk. Um, I am sort of biased regarding New Donk City because I live in New York. I'm a New Yorker at heart. Um, and clearly it's New York City. So I'm, I, I just love that whole that whole exploration of that whole little New York city map and just that the uh, whole scenery. I mean, jump up superstar is like, it's so good. And whenever I play Odyssey now, I pretty much just have that on repeat. Um, other moments I really liked were um, from horizon zero dawn. Um, there's a couple of really memorable moments. Um, the first time you take on a sawtooth, which is like a little lower level monster um, as you progress through the game. But, it's sort of the first monster you take on after the tutorial and it's kind of showing you like how, how tough this game is going to be. Um, but also like the incredible feats you're going to be able to sort of tackle. So that was pretty memorable. Um, the ending of near, um, anyone who played that again. Um, and then the final uh, battle of a uh, fire emblem echoes shadows of Valentia was also very memorable. Um, particularly the music, um, it's uh it's phenomenal um i've snuck some fire emblem soundtracks into the podcast before uh, yes we've to... noticed <laughs> i might try to uh sneak uh, twilight of the gods which is the final uh, theme from valentia and at some point um i just that game i loved um i'm trying to not turn this into why rq loves fire emblem but um just the i liked that it really went back to its roots and it was a much more difficult game. It was definitely, it asked more of the player than Awakening or Fates, but it also did it in a more fair way. Um, whereas for anyone who's played Fates or Awakening um, on Lunatic or Lunatic Plus, the difficulty was just kind of cruel and it was just random skill sets and unwinnable situations. Um, and Echoes did a much better job of making the difficulty really tough, but also fair. All right. And Saf, what about you? Well, my favorite game of this year was Horizon Zero Dawn, by far. I love the environment, the graphics. I love the story, of course. It's the only game uh, this year that made me cry, actually. And uh, the gameplay was pretty great. Um, I liked uh, Super Mario Odyssey 2, though I'm only at, uh, I only played that uh, sequence in uh, New Dawn City yesterday. <laughs> But I'm trying to catch up. And uh, yeah, those are my two favorites uh, this year. All right. So we've gone through your, your favorite moments. We've gone through the things that you've liked. Now let's kind of flip that on its head. What did you dislike about the games that you've played last year? And what disappointed you about those games? And, and what do you wish was potentially done a little bit better? Saf, we'll start with you this time. Well, the game that must that disappointed me the most was uh, Breath of the Wild. It was awesome, of course, with the graphics, which were very pretty for the Nintendo for a Nintendo console. But I, as much as I like uh, open worlds, um, I didn't like the 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 quests weren't uh, linear enough for me. I prefer when quests are linear, taking you from a place to another. 
and and I found it pretty repetitive too. Okay, Glick, what about you? Uh, let's see, low points. Uh, well, probably start off with a game I haven't mentioned yet, uh, River City Ransom Underground, which is a sort of a sequel to an old NES game called River City Ransom. It was a beat 'em up where you played as two high schoolers who were just beating up a bunch of high school gangs. It's just far too simple for how uh, complex beat-em-ups have gotten over the years, because it's just simple punch-kick for a good long while until it tries to give you more combos, but for about... I'm probably about six hours in, and I'm still just doing the same punch-kick combo over and over again. And it's not enjoyable. I can understand why. And lastly, RQ, what about you? Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. Um, I hinted at my opinion on Mass Effect Andromeda already. Uh, the less said about that, the better. Um, considering the heights that franchise had, especially the first two games, 85% of the third game, to have such a, a collapse, I guess would be the way to put it, um, there's a lot going on, unfortunately, behind the scenes at BioWare. Um, they're taking teams off a lot of their other resources and putting all their eggs in the Anthem basket, which is a conversation for probably next year's version of this cast, given the game is not going to be out for another year or so. Um, but in particular, the one thing that really, it just, it looked bad, which is something that has never really been remotely a problem for Mass Effect. I mean, sure, sometimes the facial animations were not the best or some of the mocap stuff in Mass Effect was not as good as other games, but the environments and the and just the art style were just a step down, really, which considering uh there's there's comparisons out there of uh the PC version of Mass Effect two, which came out like five or six years ago compared to Andromeda, and it's just it's mind boggling that Mass Effect two looks better than a game that came out like six years after it. Um Besides that, the other really big disappointment, uh, non-Battlefront 2 division, was Destiny 2. I know, I know, I should have learned from Destiny 1, but for the second time in Destiny's history, um, a bunch of my friends were like, oh man, it's going to be great, we're all going to get it, we're all going to just crush it, we're going to raid, we're going to do all that, we're going to do um, all of the strikes, we're going to play the Crucible, and then, so we did that, just like last time, for about a month, and then... Bungie just continued to make poor decisions in terms of player communication and fixing bugs and putting out new content and gating content behind paywalls and just a bunch of other junk. They they've had it so certain PS4 gets more than the than the uh, Xbox and it's just it's a mess, um, which is a disappointment because they had a lot of potential with both the first game and the second game. Um, and lastly, of course, uh, we can't talk about crushing disappointments without mentioning. Uh, Battlefront 2, um, just the entire release. Um, it's a shame because I played it for a bit. It's not a bad game. It's actually it's better than the first, well, first remade Battlefront, the the new one, I should say. Um, it's it's good. The story's pretty good actually. Um, it really gives you a different perspective because you're I don't know if, uh, how much you guys know, but you're following sort of the Imperials, and it's pretty rare for a Star Wars game. I know Force Unleashed did it. I know uh, the Old Republic MMO has the whole Imperial half, but most Star Wars sort of narratives and games follow the Rebels or the Republic or the light side. So to have a full, real experience where you're following Imperials is uh, is pretty great. Um, it's nice change of pace, um, but it's just a shame that the game was really hurt by the public reception. Well, it seems like it was more hurt by the publisher interference than anything actually wrong with the game. Well, I mean, if you notice, uh, two of those three games I listed were EA. So <laughs> Yeah, EA has had a, another bad year, and like a whole decade of bad years. And yet they make more money off uh, Ultimate Team and FIFA than all of these games combined, so it doesn't even matter. I mean, I guess you can't... Uh... You really can't bash someone who's doing something and still earning money off of it, um, even if their games are subpar. Well, I'm pretty sure we can bash them when they, when whatever they're doing is causing the government to interfere with the video game industry. <laughs> yeah, right? 
<laughs> okay, fine, that's fair. EA is totally screwed up multiple times this year. Yeah, I mean, to get the federal government on them when the federal government can't get anything done is actually kind of impressive. All right, so I guess, uh, you know, given that we are a, a Pokemon site and given that uh, Pokemon is part of Nintendo, we really can't have a 2017 year of gaming in review without talking about the really big Nintendo release from 2017. I am, of course, talking about the Switch. So, you know, my question to you three, as someone who really has not bought a Switch yet, is, is it worthwhile to buy a Switch, and why? Let's start with Glick on this one. At this point, yeah, absolutely. Odyssey and Breath of the Wild are two console sellers immediately, and the uh, eShop, while it doesn't have uh, the virtual consoles up yet, the games that have been releasing on that have all been pretty good. All right. RQ, how about you? Uh, my answer is also yes. Um, I got a Switch on launch day, um, which was chaos, but it was worth it in the long run. Um, I mean, Breath of the Wild alone, yes, I know it's on the Wii U, but, like, how many people own a Wii U? Like, four? Um, so, uh, for Breath of the Wild and Odyssey alone, it's 100% worth it. Um, but beyond that, there's ARMS, there's, um, as we said, they're working on getting virtual consoles up. Um, in particular, I completely forgot about this uh, one highlight of my gaming year was uh, Golf Story, um, which was sort of a little indie game um, that's sort of your classic. It's almost an 8-bit, like 16-bit RPG combined with like golf, which is something that is very strange, but the dialogue is written like as a comedy. So it's like a weird kind of comedy golf rpg which on the surface really doesn't sound like it would work but it was fantastic and i loved it a comedy golf rpg sounds like a caddyshack game it's it actually kind of kind of is it's got similar like hijinks to it uh not to the degree of caddyshack obviously but it definitely it has that feel i would definitely agree with that i can also think of a lot of golf related puns but you guys probably don't want me to start getting into that Oh yeah, let's uh, let's avoid that. And uh, but yeah, overall the switch is one hundred percent worth it um, at this point, and the library is only going to grow as we move into uh, twenty eighteen. And Saf, what about you? Well, I agree that uh, the switch is worth buying because of Super Mario Odyssey. <laughs> and though I agree it might look like a gadget feature, I really like being able to take my switch when I have to catch a train and continue playing on the way. I just wish I just wish the battery had a little longer lifespan because it's not as good as the 3 dss is. All right, definitely fair opinions across the board. Uh, I guess sometime during 2018, I will be picking up a Switch. Hooray for that! And I'll be getting a copy of Ultra Moon sometime <laughs> in 2018. <laughs> mm. So I guess. Um, Speaking of 2018, is there anything that any of you are really looking forward to this year as far as uh, gaming goes? Um, you know, I know that we have gotten one or two Nintendo Directs about games being released later this year. Uh, you know, do any of you have any strong opinions about anything we've seen so far and or potentially the lack of news, at least in the uh, recent Nintendo Mini Direct, about the Pokemon game for this Switch? Well, on the Nintendo side, um. I'm waiting for Mario Tennis Aces um, because I'd really like to see a story mode like on the GBA uh, because we didn't have one on the 3DS in Mario Tennis Open. And for other publishers, the only game I'm really waiting for is uh, World of Warcraft Battle for Azeroth, which will probably release uh, by the end of the year. And that's about all because I didn't see m many games that coat my interest all right rq what about you so i've got a big list of things i'm looking forward to in 2018 um starting with fire emblem switch even though we know absolutely nothing about it um so i'll just leave that there um really looking forward to hearing more um beyond that um bloodstained ritual of the night is finally coming out in about six weeks i think and oh yes i've been waiting forever for that game i know right i kickstarted it at a pretty high tier um because I've always loved the old school Castlevania games and what we've been seeing in terms of E3 demos and, and trailers and commentary um, 
is I'm really hoping that it's as big of a success as one of the other real Kickstarter successes like Shovel Knight. I feel like it's in that tier where it's going to be a hit, it's going to be a classic, and I'm really looking forward to it. Um, God of War 4, um, I don't think I really need to say much just due to how well received that franchise is with a certain kind of beat em up hack and slash action junkie, and I'm one of those, so looking forward to that. And uh, Far Cry 5, um, I've always been a big fan of the Far Cry series, um, and I'm interested to see where they take this one. Um, they're kind of setting it out, uh, I think it's, it's either Montana or Wyoming, it's one of those two, um, and it's sort of dealing with a lot of uh, themes that are of particular interest to sort of Americans who are living in a certain political situation. Um, and it looks like it's really going to be a different take on sort of the Far Cry franchise, which has kind of been known for dropping white guy into weird exotic locale and having him shoot up the place. Now it's sort of flipping that on its head where it's in middle America. And so I'm looking forward to that. And lastly, the new Kirby game. Um, I know we don't know that much about it yet, uh, but the Kirby games have always been really solid. Um, and I've always been a huge fan. I, I first picked up the series. Uh, I missed the Dreamland era, but Kirby 64 was one of those weird games that is kind of a cult following more than anything else. But that's the one that really got me into the series. So I've always loved Kirby ever since growing up. Uh, so that's probably the last game I'm looking forward to. All right. And what about you, Glick? Well, I already have my first game of 2018, Dragon Ball Fighters. Probably going to be a bit of a tough year trying to balance between that and... Uh, Street Fighter V Arcade Edition, which came out, I believe, just last week, trying to bounce between two fighting games. I also want to go back and pick up Persona 5 that I missed out for 2017. A uh, game I backed a Kickstarter for called Indivisible is slated to come out sometime late this year. No idea if it's actually going to make that deadline yet, but I've been looking forward to that for about two years now. Oh, that's why the people who did Skullgirls, right? Yes. That's right. Yeah. No, I am, I'm actually looking forward to that, too. I completely forgot about that. I think I actually kickstarted that, too, now that I think about it. <laughs> uh, Emmy, you mentioned the Pokemon Switch game not being mentioned at the last mini direct we had. I don't know why would you expected it to be. It's a mini direct. The first home console main series Pokemon game is going to have its own direct if it's not being main showed at E3. That is true. But, you know, more so I'm, I'm referring to the fact that overall there hasn't been much information about it yet. I mean, if I'm remembering from last year correctly, we learned about the, the 2018 game on the Switch before we learned about Ultra Sun, Ultra Moon. Uh, no, it was about two days after that we learned about the Switch game. I, I thought they were the same. I thought they were the same uh, direct. Roughly the same time, you know, maybe within a couple of days of each other. But again, the, the point is we heard about this at the same time that we heard about, or roughly the same time that we heard about Ultra Sun, Ultra Moon. And yet, you know, and I guess, you know, part of it makes sense. For 2017, they really did need to hype up Ultra Sun, Ultra Moon because they, they wanted to sell it, not just have people, you know, ignore it and go straight to the Switch. But, you know, I'd be thinking that now Ultra Sun, Ultra Moon is out. You know, maybe we'd start to hear a little bit more about it. You know, maybe maybe that's just me. Well, maybe that, that's... that uh, initial uh, little snippet from Tsunakazu Ishihara saying... They're making a game for the Switch was an obvious reaction to everyone's displeasure with them announcing Ultra Sun Ultra Moon after we had like two months ago previously had the Eurogamer article about Pokemon Stars. They didn't really want to talk about the Pokemon Switch game then. They needed to do damage control. I suppose that's fair. I would agree with that theory more if we had don't have a similar um, sort of information hole in, in terms of Fire Emblem Switch, which is a similar situation where it's a franchise that was mostly on handhelds moving from the 3DS to the Switch. We sort of have a similar gap of information there. So I don't know if that's because they're still working. They're still working through a lot of development issues or if they just don't have a better timeline or as if you said, they could be doing damage control. I just, I just don't know. But what we do know is that we don't know anything about either of those. Or it could just be Nintendo announcing a game long before it's ever intended to release, as usual. As usual. <laughs> I remember them announcing uh, Fire Emblem Cross Shin Megami Tensei like 
three years before it finally came out on the Wii U as Sharp FE. Oh boy, do I have opinions on that game. <laughs> well, now is the time to express your opinions on those games, because at this point I've run out of questions, so I'm going to open up the floor and not drop you all into the Rancor pit, but let you all discuss... Uh, you know, other various things about this past year of gaming that you maybe haven't gotten to talk about, maybe some of your favorite franchises, and so forth. So, um, you know, let's try to have a little order to the chaos. Let's start with our queue. Okay, um, so a couple quick hits of things that didn't fit into other categories. The game I played most this year was Fire Emblem Heroes on the phone. Knew that was coming. Yeah. Um, so I've got a little bit to talk about there. Um, as we all know, Nintendo's starting to get into the mobile game universe, um, and they actually announced that they're shutting down Mitomo in a couple months, um, and that was their first attempt. Uh, Fire Emblem Heroes was their second attempt, and they, they knocked this one out of the park. Um, for a phone game, it's, it's phenomenal. Um, yes, it's sort of a basic version of your classic Fire Emblem, but to put it on a phone and to be able to put out the level of content they have, they've gotten a couple hundred heroes into the game now. Um, there's some people like to talk about they don't have enough of the old heroes, they have too many of the new heroes from Awakening of Fates, but in terms of just putting the Fire Emblem experience on the phone, it was incredible. Um, and the level of difficulty that they've been able to put in with some of their more recent uh, challenge modes is again, to be able to make a game that difficult and require that much strategy on a phone is something I never saw coming. Um, the other sort of more obscure thing I kind of wanted to mention was, because um, it got missed and I don't want that to happen, is I'm so happy that they finally put out a new Metroid game. <laughs> that was that was something I've been waiting for for years. Um, and now I just need them to bring Samus back to the Switch. That would be a huge thing for me. Well, they've got the Metroid Prime 4 coming out sometime. Sometime. I I know. Um, I'm hoping that that is as good as we expected from especially Prime 1. I, w I w really wish they would put the, the uh, Metroid 2 remake on the Switch, because now that we have the Switch, I never want to touch my 3DS again. <laughs> See, it's funny you say that, because um, I know Sapphire brought up the point earlier that the Switch being so portable is such a great asset. I try not to use it on the train. I It's just too big. Um, this might be a New York City subway thing, but it's pretty rare for me to have enough room to be having the Switch in my hand with how crowded those trains are. So there's still definitely a place, at least in my world, for my 3DS. It is a bit large for a portable console. It's, I think it's actually as wide as the old Sega Game Gear was. That massive brick. <laughs> the battery life's at least a little better than the Game Gear, I'll tell you. Yeah, it lasts longer than 12 minutes. <laughs> which is <laughs> which is nice. Well, the French trains are more comfy than uh, New York's trains. Yeah, no surprise there. <laughs> <laughs> I would guess that when I get a Switch, I will be in the same boat as you are, Q, if I ever have to take the train, because I bet you Chicago trains are not so good for this either. Yeah, but I'll tell you, when I'm on a plane, though, the Switch is, I mean, it's fantastic. Um, especially I luck out in that my um, my phone charges with the USB-C port like the Switch does, which is not the most commonly used uh, charging port yet. So I've got a couple of the, um, the really big uh, external batteries that I have for my phone also have to work for my Switch, which has been really great because now I can get like 8 to 10 hours of battery life on my Switch. Um, which is kind of hard to do, um, especially if you're using like online features or have the screen up or anything like that. Like I, I get really good battery life on my Switch, which is great for flights and things like that. So it's definitely very nice to have a portable console like that, especially because obviously the PS4 and the Xbox One are not what you would call portable. I mean, and Saf did mention earlier on that uh, the, the biggest disadvantage that the Switch has over the 3DS is that normally the 3DS battery will last longer. So, you know, if you're using it for portability, battery life is very important. Oh, for sure. Yes, but the 3DS doesn't play Doom, so... Yet. <laughs> Considering I think they put the original Doom on, like, microwaves by now. I'm kind of surprised they don't have it on the 3DS yet. <laughs> 
I've seen someone put uh, Doom on a Porsche. There you go. <laughs> That's, I want to see that now. That's amazing. One of the downsides of the Switch, though, is the home dock has no wired connection. So that any online has to be wireless, which if you have subpar wireless is really bad. Yeah, that that is the the other thing I agree with that is no HDMI port on the Switch itself, which is just like a strange thing too. So if you you've got your charger, you've got your Switch, and you've got your HDMI cable, and you're on the road, and you forget to bring your dock, you can't plug the Switch into the TV. That's just I don't get it. Seems like a really major design flaw for something they intend for you to carry around and play with other people. Yeah, they're, they're commercial where they're on the on the rooftop and doing all that fun stuff. Who's going to lug around the Switch dock? It doesn't fit into my carrying case. Um, it actually burned me the first time I was on the road. I was visiting some people in San Francisco and I was like, I have my Switch. And it was, this was like the first week the Switch was out. And this was when if you hadn't pre-ordered it or gotten lucky, you could not get a Switch um, outside of Nintendo World in Manhattan. So I had the Switch and I wanted to like show it off because it was not something that a lot of people had yet. And so I've got the Switch, I've got the HDMI cable, and I've got everything else. I can't plug it into the TV. And it was like a massive letdown because I was like having people like play Breath of the Wild on the little screen. And it just wasn't the same experience um, as having it on the TV. All right, Seth, you've been pretty quiet. Anything to add? Well, a game that surprised me in a good way was Avon Colony. Uh, I don't know if you heard about it. It's a game in which you build your colony on a on a planet you're you're visiting and you have to manage this planet so it sustains itself with a flow of uh, colonists uh, coming regularly you have to make sure they they have everything they need and the graphics are pretty good uh, in my opinion for a little indie game and uh, another game that I liked that wasn't really a big game was Ever Oasis Hope I'm pronouncing it right this time. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a game in which you go outside and uh, battle uh, little creatures. And you have to take care of your oasis uh, in order to have the people uh, in it uh, survive uh, against uh, the, the dark, dark stuff uh, you have to battle. And it's fun. Uh, it's fun to play uh, on the go, and that's about it. <laughs> All right. Any uh, any other comments? Anything before we wrap up? So, what did you play this year? I know you kind of dodged the question earlier, Emmy, but what did you actually play? Uh, I kind of gave you the list. I was playing Pokemon Sun at the beginning of the year. I started playing Civilization VI a tiny bit. Got nostalgic for Civilization 3, which I found on Steam for 5 bucks, and there went a lot of my gaming time. And of course, after November, I started playing Ultra Moon. That's about all that I played this year. Uh, Civilization has a year. habit of doing that. I mean, I put in a few hundred hours of Civ 5 time over the last year and a half. I haven't even gotten Civ 6 yet, because the friends I play Civ 5 with, we still have a game that's been going on for like three months. So we're not going to get Civ 6 until we finish that game with Civ 5. Yeah, I I really do enjoy the Civilization series. The uh, Civ 3 was the first one that I ever played. Uh, you know, my my neighbor across the street had it and I would go over to their house and I would uh, sit in their den and and watch them play and I was like, "Hey, this is pretty cool." Um so I ended up getting it for myself on an actual CD. And somewhere in between my moves to and from college and, and back and, and so forth, I, I lost the CD. Uh, so I thought, no, I, I've, I've lost it for good. But I, like I said, I, I found it on Steam for five bucks pretty early in 2017. And, you know, I, I quite enjoyed playing it. And one of my favorite features of Civ 3 that, that I really couldn't find with Civ 5 or Civ 6, at least not as, as easy or as accessible, was the map editing feature. How it had this whole Civ edit thing where I could go in and I could basically create custom maps, custom rules, custom civilizations, you know, exactly as I wanted. And it, it was really fun. You know, I'm, I'm not a very social gamer. 
You know, I, I often find myself playing single player mode on, on pretty much everything. And Civilization and, and even Pokemon to a certain degree are, are no exception to that. Um, so, you know, I, I really did like Civilization 3 single player. Um, I've even occasionally tried to play it on Sid mode, which is absolutely beastly. That's just um, unfair. It really is. It, it really is. <laughs> but that's, I mean, that's the point. But yeah, so, I mean, I guess, you know, I'm, I'm kind of more of a, a solo gamer than a social gamer, but that just kind of fits my overall introverted personality. I know, you know, I, I sound very extroverted and I sound very outgoing when I do these recordings, but in actuality, I'm, I'm a very interesting combination where I inherited my, my mother's introvertedness and my father's ability to schmooze. So, you know, it's, it's an interesting combination that serves me well, but, you know, when I'm gaming, I'm kind of more so in my own zone and, you know, games like Civilization 3 and, and, you know, the, the single player of, of Pokemon are really what, what I do. You know, I, I wish that they'd come out with either an actual translated version of Mother 3 or, uh, you know, maybe a, another game in the series, although I really don't know how they can potentially get that better than it already was. You know, I, I really did, back in the day, enjoy the, the Mother series. Uh, like I said earlier in, in this conversation, I, I played the original Sonic trilogy on the Genesis back when that came out. Um and again, lots, lots of, you know, single player, lots of one person stuff, because that's just kind of who I am and, and what I do. So I think the biggest takeaway from that is for our younger listeners out there, yes, games for the PC actually did used to come on CDs. I know. They did, yes. Mind blowing. Steam wasn't always a thing. I know. It's kind of shocking, actually. Um, but jokes aside, um, the Mother 3 thing particularly continues to surprise me especially with how popular Undertale was whenever that came out two or three years ago. I mean, that's pretty much just Mother 3 kind of ripped off and reskinned and kind of pared down a little bit. And it's, for how popular that game was, it's shocking to me that Nintendo hasn't capitalized and put out either, as you said, an English version of Mother 3 or a sequel or anything in that sort of genre or landscape, if you would. Well, they are capitalizing. They're putting it out on the Switch. Undertale, I mean. I walked right into that. I knew that was coming. <laughs> I knew that was coming as soon as I started that point. <laughs> that really is the easiest capitalization, since it requires no input on their part. And it doesn't even require using the shift key. <laughs> you got me there. You got me there. Um, also, I didn't think we'd get a game as old as Civ 3 into this... Uh, 2017 gaming year in review cast well, so you, you asked i did i did i will admit that um well if we want to talk about old games i actually popped in my game a uh, copy of metal gear solid v the phantom pain <laughs> <laughs> oh man you know what pandora's box did you open rq i know i know what i did <laughs> Well, we can always have a, a later podcast where we go over in more greater depth some of our favorite games of all times, uh, and, you know, all of the games that we've potentially played throughout both the Pokemon and, you know, other franchises that we've enjoyed throughout the years. Uh, you know, like I said, Civilization Three, Sonic's, uh, you know, original Sonic trilogy, some of us have been gaming for quite a while. <laughs> We're old. So, a, a little bit. <laughs> Yep. Before we go, I'd like to take this time to shill for the game Pyre. Oh, I'm seconding that. That game was amazing. Yes. It's by Supergiant Games, the same developers of Bastion and Transistor. I still need to finish Transistor. Yes, you do. I, I, play, I played through Bastion like five times. That game was so good. Bastion and Transistor are more action games, but Pyre is a bit different in that it's a sports game. Space basketball! <laughs> like like Space Jam? No. No. There's no Michael Jordan. Boo. But it's one part sports game, one part visual novel, one part sports manager game. And it works. I know. It's like Golf Story earlier. That sounds weird, but it just really, really works. The writing is phenomenal. And it's beautiful. It is the best looking game they've put out. Oh, yeah. It's that same art style, um, especially closer to Transistor than Bastion, but 
it's really just upgraded. The visuals are amazing. And the music is also as good as Supergiant always makes. And that's out on Steam, PS4, and I think the Xbox One, the digital stores. Nope, we were not paid to say this by Supergiant Games or Warner Brothers <laughs> or anybody else associated with Pyre. But we would accept money. We would. We well. definitely would. <laughs> or just a free copy of whatever next game you make. That, that'd do two. Oh, I'd shoot for that. Let's shoot for that. Well, if it's a basketball game, aren't you shooting for twos and threes? I think that's our cue to uh, to call it a day. Fair enough. All right, so uh, let's wrap things up here. Thank you all for uh, joining me today. And, uh, you know, join us for the next BulbaCast episode where we're going to try something a little bit different. As for what that is, well, we're still kind of working out the details, so you'll find out uh, after we've recorded the next episode. Thanks for listening, and... If you're watching this on YouTube, feel free to comment below about what your favorite games and least favorite games of 2017 were, and feel free to comment about how old I am that I'm still enjoying Civilization 3. We'll see you guys next time. To understand.